Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us. We all made it to Friday again. Your stool is ready for good, bad, and crazy martinis. And Jim, before we get to the actual martinis, I thank you for indulging me on a mini rant about Virginia's Republican Convention, which is scheduled for tomorrow. It's a drive-in convention at a number of sites in the various congressional districts. And this is to nominate uh, statewide nominees for governor, lieutenant governor, and uh, attorney general. At one time, everyone in the state who wanted to vote in this was expected to go to a bunch of parking lots at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, they've done a little bit better than that. But now the, the candidates are in. If you wanted to vote, you had to sign up a number of weeks ago. So you can't just show up to vote. You have to have already signed up. I wasn't going to do it. I didn't even think I was eligible. And then... Uh, Somebody from one of the campaigns came to the door and explained how it worked. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to be in that part of the county anyway on Saturday. Uh, Hopefully it doesn't take too long. So you you sign up, you give the email, and uh, they're going to send you some information on how the process is going to work. So you give them your phone number, too. Oh, my word. The text messages from all of these people who are running for these three offices so-and-so loves this guy. So-and-so actually said something nice about Hillary Clinton back in the 2000s. And just back and forth and back and forth. And then the mailers start coming. I mean, Virginia Republican Party, if you want me to never participate in a nominating process again, you are doing a phenomenal job. And if it takes more than 30 seconds to do this tomorrow, I'm leaving. It's a drive-in, so I don't even have to like get out of line. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely absurd. My favorite piece of attack literature, though, was in the lieutenant governor's race. It actually was a flyer that, that came in the mail, and it was for a candidate who said, this person launched a write-in campaign when Corey Stewart was our nominee for Senate and cost him the race against Tim Kaine. First of all, no write-in campaign cost Corey Stewart. He lost by a lot. And secondly, any Republican who thinks Corey Stewart shouldn't have been the Republican nominee Uh, that's only going to make me support them more. So well done on the attack piece there. But uh, Jim, uh, based on our conversations, it sounds like you've avoided this monstrosity. So good for you. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's it's not out of, uh, you know, it, 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 I really don't know if like it's a triumph for apathy is really the rallying cry. I want to lay it out there. Um, just observe, Greg. Yeah, it sounds like voting in this primary is ridiculously complicated and they've constantly been changing the rules and they can't just hold a regular primary the way everybody else does. But look, Greg, when you're the Virginia Republican Party, you've had such a record of sterling success <laughs> for so long that you don't need to worry about turnout in the primary process, right? Like, if there's any institution in the entire country that has earned the right to rest on their laurels, it's the Virginia Republican Party that has won, won like one good election out of the last 12 years. Are we coming up on 16 now? Uh, it's almost 12 years since they uh, they swept, yeah, with uh, McDonald and Bowling and Cuccinelli. And so, yeah, from what I've heard, it's uh, somewhere between 55 and 60,000 people statewide are going to decide this whole thing. So if you ever wanted to really rally the base, this is obviously not the way to do it. But they're horrifically concerned that because there's no party affiliation and registration in Virginia, that a bunch of Democrats are going to show up in the Republican primary uh, and, uh, you know, nominate the person who is least likely to be a formidable challenger to Terry McAuliffe. But uh, I don't know. This isn't clearly working either, as far as I can tell. But anyway, on to our actual martinis today. Jim, good news on the um, on the voting legislation front. Of course, we heard that uh, what was happening in Georgia was Jim Crow on steroids. Even the president of the United States said that repeatedly. Uh, that led to uh, such a whipping up of uh, fanaticism that the boycott started and, and Biden got in on it. He essentially saying he'd be fine with Major League Baseball moving the All-Star game. And then when the blowback happened, uh, long after even Delta and Coke got on the woke bandwagon there, all of a sudden, oh, there's going to be $100 million of revenue lost because they lost the All-Star game. And then you saw the reverse skate from Ossoff uh, and especially Warnock and, of, of course, Stacey Abrams, who even went in and stealth edited her uh, her op-ed for USA Today uh, to make it look like she wasn't encouraging a boycott. So uh, the fact that the blowback has um, succeeded, I've seen polls showing that more Georgians, albeit narrowly, uh, support the the changes to protect election integrity than, than oppose them is a good sign. And also the Wall Street Journal today 
talking about the situation in both Florida and Texas. Uh, we heard a, a little bit uh, in the news yesterday about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signing the legislation, mainly because he uh, only let Fox cover it. Not sure why, but of course, the other media had a conniption fit over that. And in Texas, um, early this morning, after an all-night debate, Republicans in the House, mostly along party lines, uh, also voted to increase penalties for voting irregularities. Uh, it still needs to be reconciled to the Senate bill. Uh, who knows what kind of hysterics we'll get in response to this. There may be some provisions that aren't such a good idea, but in general, making it easier to vote and harder to cheat, like Tim Scott said in the uh, State of the Union response, is a good thing. So uh, ignore the the hysterical noise on the left and do the right thing. And it seems to be working. Yeah, I, a couple things worth jumping at. There's no point to rehash the entire Georgia argument about the Georgia election laws and what actually changed. And uh, there are plenty of examples in which people were hyperbolically talking about provisions that have been taken out during the amendment process and how much uh, I think it was even Senator Raphael Warnock signed off on this email that denounced the law for doing certain things that it didn't actually do. Um, the But I think there are a couple of things that jump out about this. First is that, you know, this is a lesson to Texas and, and Florida Republicans. If you believe what you're doing in these laws, stand by it. Don't don't run away and hide. Don't uh, back away. And the other, you know, you know, yes, it's probably going to be mislabeled. Yes, the Democrats are going to lie about it. Come out and say, look, here's the bill text. Take a look, see what it actually does. Uh, and you have a really good chance of surviving this. I think the detail in my colleague Kyle Smith's article, this ran just a couple of days ago, uh, entitled How the Boycott Georgia Movement Flopped. I had completely missed this. Greg, they're making a sequel to Black Panther, uh, even though uh, the the feature actor uh, has passed away. They're still going to take place in Wakanda. Greg, it's going to be filmed in Georgia. <laughs> so if Black, if Georgia's laws aren't enough to stop the filming of Black Panther in the state, then it really can't be that bad. Now, the director said he issued a statement saying he opposed the law. They're still going to film it in Georgia. Uh, if you can't get the Black Panther to boycott Georgia, you're not going to get many other uh, other companies to do it. There is no states are not going to be punished for this. The the, the uh, bark is worse than the bite. The roar uh, doesn't have that much action behind it. Don't you know, it was and here's the thing. We can argue about these laws. I think it is very clear that because so many provisions and, and the way the 2020 election occurred. They had to make emergency changes because of the pandemic. They didn't want lots of people standing online all close to each other. They didn't want lots of people standing all close to each other in the polling places. That was all perfectly sensible. That was all perfectly necessary. By November 2021 or November 2022 and beyond that, we fully expect the pandemic to be pretty much behind us. You could argue that with so many Americans vaccinated, it's largely behind us now. Normal life is returning. We can't ha operate under these emergency provisions forever. So it's perfectly within the rights of the state legislatures to say, OK, what kind of emergency changes do we want to keep? Which ones do we want to rescind? And how do we want our elections to operate from here on out? And Democrats have just as much right to go in and try to change the process as anybody else. It is not this vast, grand conspiracy to change the law so that Democrats can never win elections, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that so little came out of this when this was, I think it was back when I was on vacation, the movement of the all-star game. This was like the biggest issue in politics for like a, a, at least a week, maybe two weeks. And then the, th the like a summer thunderstorm, it came on very quickly and then it passed very quickly and the consequences were quickly forgotten. So uh, the idea, you know, this is a good signal for Republicans in Texas and Florida. They should go full speed ahead and not be afraid of some massive boycott of their states. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just almost staggered there by that director saying, I oppose this. But I'm still going to do my job and I'm not going to light everything on fire that we've already planned to do. I believe that's called being an adult and uh, actually still going on with your life and not trying to burn the whole thing down. So uh, good Greg, on that. Are we still allowed to do that? I didn't know that. I thought you just had to go completely crazy and hope that uh, your outrage eventually uh, won people over. So, no, good to see. Good to see. All right, Jim, brand new sponsor today. It's a name you will not forget when you are looking for the best ways to take care of your cat. It is the Kitty Poo Club. Look, working from home means more time for your morning coffee or an occasional afternoon nap. And, of course, the opportunity for your uh, feline friend to maybe walk across the keyboard in the middle of your Zoom call. I don't have a cat, so that doesn't happen to me, but I hear it does. Uh, look, you love having your cat around, but you don't love being around that litter box. Yes, you heard us. 
Kitty Poo Club. Every month, Kitty Poo Club delivers an affordable, high-quality, recyclable litter box that is pre-filled with the litter of your choice. The boxes are leak-proof, eco-friendly, and have a fun design for every season. Now, when the month is up, you just recycle the box, and Kitty Poo Club will automatically deliver a new one to you. No changing used litter and no more cleaning the box. You can customize your order based on how many cats you have, and you can choose from four different litter types. Kitty Poo Club has a no-risk satisfaction guarantee, and you can easily customize or cancel anytime. And right now, Kitty Poo Club is offering you 20% off your first order, plus a free dome, free scoop, and free shipping when you sign up auto-ship by going to kittypooclub.com slash martini. Just go to kittypooclub.com slash martini to get 20% off your first order, plus a free dome, uh, scoop, and free shipping when you set up auto-ship. That's kittypooclub.com. Dot com slash martini. All right. Moving on from uh, what cats leave behind to uh, the political version of what bulls leave behind. Let's talk about the economy and the uh, Democratic spin on this today. It's the first Friday in uh, May, which means the April jobs report is out today. Uh, there were robust projections for what we we're going to see in job creation in April we did not see that in reality. Here is CNBC, the anchor staggered by the number, which is 266,000, which, depending on the context, isn't necessarily horrible. But when you're expecting almost a million, not good. And Rick Santelli is so upset, he just cuts him off and goes off on a rant. It looks like it was a big disappointment at 266. But maybe I have that wrong. Let me double check the Bureau website here. Uh, one second. Uh, yes, 266 is correct. Unemployment change, little change is 6.1%. So we have some issues here. 266,000. Uh, unemployed. Big revision. Yes, that's what I'm... Last month, not 770 there? versus 916, yes. Uh, minus 78,000 on the revision. If we look at manufacturing, change in private payrolls, it was only 218,000. Uh, manufacturing, minus 18,000. The unemployment rate went up to 6.1. And so, Jim, of course... Joe Biden comes out this morning and says, you know what, this is proof that we're on exactly the right course because we've got to get moving on these uh, American rescue plans. We've got to pass these other two massive pieces of legislation because uh, this is exactly what it will take to uh, create this uh, great job explosion. Uh, so I think you and I would probably say it's exactly the opposite. I've heard at least anecdotal stories of people not being able to fill Positions because right now the unemployment benefits are pretty lucrative uh, to keep them, at least in some cases, you need to uh, apply for things and go to the interviews, but they end up not taking the job because in a lot of ways, it's just easier to not work and, and keep the benefits coming in. Yeah, it's really hard to believe that that is at least one factor in this number. And let me you know, I think it was uh, last month when we had a good uh, unemployment number. Uh, and good GDP numbers, you and I have said, look, as far as we're concerned, good news for the economy is good news, regardless of who's the president. And, you know, bad news for the economy is bad news for everybody, regardless of the president. That having been said, this is really bad news for the Biden administration. Uh, the first thought I had once I, too, had said, whoa, that's a bad number uh, this morning was recognizing that or, you know, at some point next week, I think May 12th is when they release the updated consumer price index data. Um, that's kind of your main measurement of inflation. And what are the arguments folks on the right have been saying as the government starts to go on this spending spree under the Democratic Congress and the Biden administration? Well, we're going to argue that you know, if you throw this much money around to the economy, one, you create a disincentive for people to go to work because they can always get you know, generous uh, benefits from the government. But then the second thing also is that the, you, know, the, you create inflation, more money flowing around, chasing fewer goods, prices go up. Uh, now, the last consumer price index report last month, I believe, was the highest one in like a decade or something. Now, if the, if the next one on May 12th isn't that bad, OK, it's a one month blip, something unusual caused by the, the, uh, the pandemic winding down, people going back to work. Shouldn't worry about it too bad. If it's really bad on, on next Tuesday or so, then all of a sudden inflation is back. Then all of a sudden it's not a weird little blip. And we now have to really worry about this. And what are the two things that you know, Republicans have been warning about? Uh, inflation and high unemployment uh, or, or from, from Democrats for a long time. For a long time, Democrats said, no, no, look at the economy under Bill Clinton. Look at the economy under Barack Obama. Although you and I pointed out that the recovery from the Great Recession was a very long and slow and frustrating one. 
Um, this is, you know, this is a giant warning sign that, oh, wait a second, maybe all these, maybe these large sweeping uh, actions by this new democratic controlled government is not moving the economy in their direction. Actually, it's making things worse. And this, this concept of, of runaway inflation eating up all the money that you're getting from the government and then you go, yeah, the government's sending you a check. They're sending you stimulus. They're getting a bonus. You all this, all this kind of stuff. But it doesn't do you any good because your purchasing power is going down because inflation is, is accelerating faster. Well, all of a sudden, you're right back where you started or maybe even in a worse position. This could be really strong and really like painful vindication for the arguments that have come from the right on all this. I don't think you can necessarily draw that conclusion from one month. But it is a giant flashing red light that not only should the Biden administration be heating, but I think Congress and everybody else in government should be heating that maybe we really have overheated the economy. Uh, interest rates are too low and that we've just, you know, we've come to a conclusion. You cannot spend your way out of the problem. People have got to go back to work. People have got to get started hiring. You can't just simply throw around government checks for really the rest of time because we've, we've spent an enormous amount since the beginning of the pandemic. It's time to start winding that stuff down, not accelerating it the way the Biden administration wants to do. We've been having this Keynesian debate for almost a century now, and it's still taken seriously. It just doesn't work. The Depression lasted longer than it should have because of this ridiculous approach. Uh, Getting out of the so-called Great Recession uh, in the late uh, 2000s, early part of the last decade, um, was slower than it should have been, slowest uh, recovery in a very long time by a lot of measures. And so I don't know why we feel like we have to go down this road again, but Biden is this old school big government uh, lefty. And so this is where we are. But even the mainstream media is getting uh, caught up on this. Uh, CNN's Christine Romans saying that uh, if you haven't felt it yet, it's coming. Higher prices for toilet paper, diapers, soft drinks, plane tickets, a tank full of gas. I think a lot of us have seen that. And Whirlpool raising prices of some of its appliances by up to 12 percent. I know some folks said uh, you're not really getting a stimulus check here. You're getting a check to cover how much more expensive everything's going to get. So hopefully that's not the case. But uh, the the indications at the moment are not great. All right. Well, let's talk about something much better than inflation and disappointing jobs reports. And that's the deal you can get on towels over at MyPillow.com. No inflation there with this deal. $65 off. These towels are fantastic, by the way. I know I talk about them all the time. They're big, they're, they're fluffy, they're soft, uh, they absorb fantastic. Uh, it's six-piece towel sets, regularly $109.99, now only $44.98 when you use the promo code MARTINI at MyPillow.com. MyPillow towel sets are made from proprietary technology that makes them highly absorbent and soft without the lotion-y feel. They are made from cotton that's grown right here in the United States. They're available in a variety of colors. They have a 60-day money-back guarantee a one-year limited warranty, and each set includes two bath sheets, two hand towels, and one two-pack washcloth. So go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listener square, enter the promo code MARTINI, or call 800-874-0104. While you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all MyPillow products, including the Giza Dream bed sheets, MyPillow premium pillows, and the new My Slippers. Get your MyPillow six-piece towel set for just $44.98, but only with our promo code MARTINI. Use it when you call 800-874-0104 or when you visit MyPillow.com today. All right, Jim, I assume uh, this weekend you'll be wishing your wife and your mom a happy birthing person's day. Yes, it's this Sunday, second Sunday in May, all the time. Oh, Mother's Day. Right, 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 right. Well, this ridiculous controversy has erupted again because the Democrats insist on uh, just destroying our lexicon. Yesterday, Missouri Congresswoman Cori Bush uh, was testifying about her experience of two very difficult pregnancies uh, before Congress. And uh, a lot of people are saying she actually made a really strong pro-life argument, even though she's clearly not pro-life, about how her son was born at just 23 weeks, had translucent skin and uh, just, I mean, just tiny, tiny, but uh, is doing fine now, 21 years old. Uh, her next pregnancy, uh, just about a year later, uh, she was about 16, maybe 18 weeks along uh, before viability. And the doctors uh, told her that she should just let it self-abort. And uh, she said no. And they looked for other help. And that child is now 20 years old. So a great pro-life message. But her tweet in talking about her testimony says this. Every day, black birthing people and our babies die because our doctors don't believe our pain. 
Uh, then you've got Nayral jumping in on this, saying when we talk about birthing people, we're being inclusive. It's that simple. We use gender-neutral language when talking about pregnancy because it's not just cisgender women that can get pregnant and give birth. Reproductive freedom is for everybody. Here's the one that really blows the mind, though. This is uh, Ayanna Presley, a congresswoman from Massachusetts, member of the squad. Uh, she says that uh, they're introducing legislation, she and Senator Booker, to expand Medicaid coverage for birthing people and to promote community-based holistic approaches to maternity care. Jim, it's called the Mommies Act. So I'm not sure that the messaging <laughs> is on the same page here. Two things. I mean, look, whatever identity you think you are, only certain people have the equipment to be impregnated and to give birth. And uh, biologically, those are called women. They are called mothers. Those words have been around for a long time, and it keeps things nice and simple. My bigger question here is, though, whatever happened to the feminist uh, ever since this movement and who belongs in women's sports came around? They've been super, super silent. Yeah, you know, the exception is J.K. Rowling, um, who is now apparently the the greatest menace on the face of the earth. <laughs> um, so, the, the, yeah, I, I look, if you uh, if you go through this great transition in life and you decide that the name everyone has known you by is not your name. You want to be called by a different name. Well, that's a little unusual, but you know what? I would go along with that. All right, fine. You know, you prefer to be called Caitlin and not Bruce anymore. All right, fine. I'll, I'll go along with that. Um, you want the pronouns? Uh, okay. I, you know, I don't think you'd argue about that. Um, but when you start saying, well, no, you really shouldn't call your mother, your mother or mom or mommy. You should refer to her as your birthing person. Screw you. No. <laughs> I'm not making that. I'm not, I'm not making that deal. You don't get to dictate the words that everybody else uses. It's one thing to say, "Call me by the name I prefer." It's another thing to say, "No, no, we've just decided to completely overhaul the English language in order to not hurt the feelings of somebody like that." Uh, no, a birthing per a birthing person is a really awkward way of saying a mother. And you know, Greg, I don't know about you, but I've got other kind of words that involve the word mother that are coming around come to mind right at this moment. <laughs> Yeah, Jim, I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure if either Mrs. Corumbus uh, was wished a happy birthing person's day, I think it would probably not go well. Uh, they would, uh, I would certainly never say to them the idea that, that they would somehow have to be relegated to birthing persons. It sounds so utilitarian, you know, it's uh, like no, no yeah. honor like, whatsoever. In this country, we call it Mother's Day. I mean, yeah, it, it would be rude, but like people, you just assume it was somebody who was like translating, putting it through Google Translate or something like that. And it'd come out awkwardly. But the thing is, the media is going to run with this now. OK, because the lefties want this legislation and they call it birthing persons because they've got to be, quote unquote, inclusive on all this stuff. The media is going to start calling it that. And, you know, with all the different language changes we're, we're seeing here, it's just amazing how much they're trying to shoehorn this into our everyday lives. Hopefully most people are just uh, rolling their eyes and, and moving on. But when it's just pounded at you time after time after time, more and more people are probably going to start doing it. I don't know if they'll do it on something like this because this is just so insane. But uh, clearly the, the Overton window on this is moving in a, in a weird direction. Indeed. And uh, man, oh man, just a uh, you know, when, when your calendar doesn't have it as Mother's Day anymore, that that'll be when you know it's 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 really going to take over. Where are the where are the feminists here? I think women deserve more honor uh, than to be called birthing persons for heaven's sake. So everyone out there, have a happy Mother's Day, especially my mom and my wife and my mother-in-law and Jim to your wife and mother and uh, all the ladies out there who have given so much to uh, give their kids a great life. We honor you. And uh, we will continue to call you mothers, and we hope you have a fantastic day. Jim, have a great Mother's Day weekend. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Launch podcast. We're very grateful for those five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Uh, again, have a great Mother's Day weekend, and please join us on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Do you want the CIA choosing their personnel based on intersectionality or based on competence? 
I'm Sarah Carter. On the latest Sarah Carter Show, I'll discuss how the Russians and Chinese must be thrilled at how identity politics are becoming more important than protecting our nation. I'll also be joined by Tiffany Smiley, the amazing wife of a wounded warrior who changed the military and the VA and is now running for the U.S. Senate in Washington State. Subscribe to The Sarah Carter Show at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.